African American Oral History in Prince George's County, Maryland. This is a series that explores and captures the rich and diverse contributions of noted African Americans. Each has a unique and personal story, all told in their own words. Clark A. Estep. This is my oral history. I was born in a small town in the southern part of Prince George's County uh, by the name of Aquasco. It, is a, it was very rural. As a matter of fact, all of Prince George's County at that time was rural except when you reach the area around the border of Washington, D.C. I was raised in a, fa a loving family. They believed very strongly in uh, education. My parents owned their own home. My home was uh, located on the main road. Um, we had our own land. We raised tobacco as a family. My family was very church oriented. My mother was an especially strong lady. She saw that we went to church every Sunday. Church was before any entertainment, anything uh, of any other nature. We had uh, family meals together. Sunday was an especially important day in the life of my family. This is when we would have a large Sunday feast. We would gather around the dining room table and uh, we would have a complete meal as a family. Living in a rural community, life, social life was very limited. The main event in uh, the rural communities was the baseball team. And on the, each Sunday, there was a baseball game. And this was the main social life in the rural communities in Prince George's County. In the community in which I grew up, it was a mixed community uh, of whites and uh, blacks. We, we were, most of the uh, students that attended elementary school were friends because we, that's all we knew. Um, we had no really social life other than the baseball games that I referred to. We mostly saw each other during school. Occasionally, we would run across uh, friends um, at the store, but uh, social life was very limited. As a matter of fact, um, the closest theater to us was in the little town of Upper Barber. Um, of course, it was a white theater where the whites were downstairs and the um, blacks had to go upstairs in the balcony. My family was, was very strong, very high on education because they felt that education was the way to life. So they put a lot of emphasis on education. I went to school in a small three-room school in Aquasco. As a matter of fact, there were one, two, or three-room schools in each rural community. The school was named after, after the community in which it was built. In the three room community, in the three room school that I attended, grades one and two was in one classroom, grades three and four were in another classroom, and grades five and six were in the third classroom. We had, each classroom had a teacher, and the fifth and sixth grade classroom had a teacher and 
the teacher in the fifth and sixth grade classroom were, uh, was the principal. When I left elementary school, I was supposed to attend Frederick Douglass Elementary Junior High School. Because of crowdedness, I attended a closed white school located in Westwood. It was a three-room school that sat in the middle of the woods. Not a house was around it. And we had excellent teachers in the seventh and eighth grade. I completed the seventh and eighth grade at Westwood and uh, entered Frederick Douglass at that time, which was an elementary, a middle, and a high school. And high schools at that time, when I entered, went to only 11th grade. But while I was in attendance at uh, Frederick Douglass, the requirement was changed. High schools then became 12th grade. The class of 19, June 1949 was the last 11th grade class. The class that graduated in June of 1950 was the first 12th grade class. From there, in high school, you had uh, general subjects that you took. You had a vocational curriculum, an academic curriculum, I t pursued the academic curriculum. And at the end of uh, high school, when I graduated, I attended Bowie State College, which was unusual for men at that, at that time because Bowie State College specialized in elementary education. I went to Bowie in 1952 and graduated in 1956. After I graduated from Bowie State College with my BS, I, was, I began teaching at Lincoln Elementary School, a segregated school. There were approximately 12 black elementary schools at that time. Lincoln happened to be one of them and I began as a fifth grade teacher at Lincoln Elementary School. After I completed my first year at Lincoln, of course the draft was uh, involved at that time, I received a notice to uh, go into the Army. The draft office was on Main Street in Upper Marlboro, which was really the center of all county business. I applied for a deferral, and of course, at that time, I was denied. I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, where I received my basic training. From Fort Benning, Georgia, I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where I attended supply school. In supply school, you were told that if you did well in your class, you were one of the top three you could, you, had a, you could select where you wanted to go uh, as your assignment. I finished first in my um, class in the Fort Bend in Georgia, went down to the office, and I chose three places that I would like to um, finish my Army career. Of course, nothing materialized. I was sent to a place I knew nothing about. I received orders that I would to go to Ryuko Island, which turned out to be Okinawa. I was flown to Okinawa, and I spent the rest of my career on the island of Okinawa in headquarters in the supply division. In July of 1959, I was discharged from the Army. I returned to Lincoln Elementary School and continued my elementary 
our career. From Lincoln, I went to uh, Oak Crest, where I taught for a half year before going into a federal program. I was the coordinator of Follow Through. Follow Through was a program that followed the Head Start children. Children who had been in Head Start then went into Follow Through because Follow Through was supposed to follow up on the gains that they had made in Head Start. After in, head, in follow through, they were having some difficulty. I received, the superintendent of schools received a letter from Mr. Williams, who was with the Health, Education, and Welfare Department, talking about the gains that had been made in the, the, head, in the follow through program. Mr. Smith, who was the superintendent, of course, White, had not appointed an elementary, a black elementary school principal in 26 years. As the county began to spread, or as blacks began to spread into the county, of course, the direction was from the Washington, D.C. outward. Blacks had migrated to Prince George's. They were living around the town of Glen Arden, and they were attending the white school of Ardmore. Blacks were very displeased with what was going on at Ardmore, and they wanted a black principal. Mr. Smith called me in one day and told me he was going to make me principal of Ardmore Elementary School. Of course, I was completely shocked. Because as I indicated, a black principal had not been appointed to an elementary school in 26 years. As a matter of fact, it was very difficult for black men to advance in uh, um, education because at that time, there were only approximately 12 elementary schools and upward mobility was very limited. I stayed at Ardmore Elementary Schools for two years and was sent to Matthew Henson Elementary School in Palmer Park. The parents at Ardmore did not want to lose me and they protested, but of course um, that did no good. And I went to Matthew Henson. I stayed there until uh, uh, 1978. At that time, the superintendent of school, Dr. Edward Feeney, appointed me administrative assistant to him. That was a very rewarding job. Um, I had uh, full input into all decisions, etc. I served, I worked for Dr. Edward J. Feeney for nine years. Dr. Feeney, of course, retired. Um, and Dr. John Murphy came in as superintendent of schools. Dr. John Murphy was from a small school district in uh, Chicago. He had never been into a, ver into a large school system. And his aim was to get a large school system like Prince George's County on his resume. We were still under the court order at that time concerning desegregation because we had desegregated schools in January 29, 1973. And of course, we were under court order when Dr. Murphy came, and we were still under, under the court order to further desegregate, to, to desegregate schools. Dr. Murphy was the superintendent who initiated magnet schools in Prince George's County. When Dr. Murphy left as superintendent. Dr. Edward J. Felge became superintendent. Dr. Felge served for four years. And for the four years, I was Dr. Felge's administrative assistant. At, at his retirement, Dr. Clark became superintendent of schools. I worked for Dr. Jerome Clark for approximately one half year before I retired. 
My retirement from Prince George's County in 1996 was the highlight of my life. Having been raised in Prince George's County, attended the segregated schools of Prince George's County, and worked for many years in the segregated schools of Prince George's County before going into the various administrative positions, it was definitely the highlight of my life. Many of my friends, colleagues, prior uh, supervisors, attended that occasion. It was held at the officers club on Andrews Air Force Base and uh, I was so elated to have that occasion shared with me by with my friends, family, former colleagues and all of the folks that I had grown up with, worked with in the county. Prince George's County is different today than when I was younger because it was strictly a rural community. As a matter of fact, all of Prince George's County was rural. There were two main uh, highways in Prince George's County. There was 301, which of course was the main highway north-south. It was a two-lane highway it ran directly through the center of Upper Marlboro, which was the county seat. All in, business, all in business of importance took place in Upper Marlboro in the county courthouse. Whether it be your marriage license, your birth certificate, certificates, your building some, uh, permits, everything of importance took place in the county seat in Upper Marlboro. The next important highway was 381, which was a two, rural two-lane highway that ran from Aquasco, and it was one of the main routes into Washington, D.C., which, which at that time was uh, an important city. All of our shopping took place in Washington, D.C. At that time, in the county, you had general stores. In the general stores, this is where you really purchased everything from farm tools, shoes, clothes, and groceries. Once or twice in the year, your parents would journey into Washington, D.C., which had all of your important uh, stores, cans, hex, etc., where you would go shopping. Most of the shopping for clothes, etc., was from catalogs. There were two main catalogs in which your parents shop from for your clothes, Sizz Roebuck or uh, Montgomery Wards. And this is how they purchase your clothes. But occasionally, about twice a year, your parents would venture into Washington, D.C. to go to downtown where the stores were segregated. You could not even sit at the food counters to eat. It is so much different today than it was when I was growing up. You can only look at how Prince George's County has developed. There are housing developments, shopping centers throughout Prince George's County, which back when I was growing up was definitely not the place to be. It was strictly the rural community in Prince George's County. Life in Prince George's County is much different today for young people than when I grew up. When I grew up, I went to segregated schools. There were two high schools for black students in Prince George's County, Frederick Douglass High School and Lakeland High School. 
And regardless of where you lived in Prince George's County, if you went to high school, you went to one of those two high schools. Developments have grown everywhere. Housing has spread it like wildfire. There are housing developments all over Prince George's County. When I purchased my home, there were limited places in which blacks could live. Blacks could not purchase a home in the community of Catherine. Most blacks purchased homes inside the Beltway. But as years went past, blacks were able to purchase homes outside the Beltway in communities at, w at one time that did not want them. And uh, the shopping centers have developed. There were no shopping centers in Prince George's County. In order for your parents to shop, they had to go down town to Washington, D.C., where your major stores were located. Hex, Cans, Garfinkel's, five, Woolworths 5 and 10. Even in Washington, D.C., you could not even eat at the lunch counters. If you wanted to buy even a hot dog, you had to purchase it, stand, and eat it. You were not allowed to sit at the counter. Opportunities are so great for young people today. Job opportunities are everywhere. When I was growing up as a youngster, there were two main job facilities in, in Prince George's County. One was Andrews Air Force Base, and the second was the school system. And in the school system, of course, in the maintenance department, blacks could get a job. But the jobs they had to take were very minimal jobs, custodians, ground maintenance, and things of that nature. Opportunities abound today for all folks. Life is great in the county. I see no reason why any youngsters growing up today cannot be successful. They have excellent schools, excellent courses, kids graduate with scholarships galore where they attend some of the most prestigious schools in the, the United States. The opportunities are there it's for youngsters to take advantage. Working in Prince George's County was uh, certainly rewarding. I've had so many highlights, successes, and moments of joy. Probably the most rewarding stories, events that I've had in Prince George's County is when my former students have come up to me and said, Mr. Restep, you remember me? You taught me at Lincoln Elementary School or you taught me at Oak Crest Elementary School and they tell me what they are doing. Of course, Congressman Al Albert Wynn was one of my students at Lincoln Elementary School I, Carsondale, which was a black community that, that uh, grew in Prince George's County, had the 50th an, uh, anniversary back in the December of uh, 2007. I was invited to their 50th anniversary. I saw many of my former students Wendy Wilson came up to me. You remember me? I was your student at Lincoln. I'm a doctor in California. Gretchen Graves, the very same thing. Byron Nicholson came and said, you remember me? I was your former student at Lincoln. You opened uh, my life in the sixth grade. I am now a doctor in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Those are the things that give you the thrill. Those are the things that make, made you happy 
that you touch the lives of many. I guess the greatest obstacle in my life was the upward movement in the school system. You see, when I started to teach, there were approximately 12 elementary schools. There were two junior, senior high schools. And mobility, upward mobility was very limited. The principals who were in those schools were in there for life. They, this made, they were, this were their career. They didn't retire, they just stayed there. So the greatest obstacle and the greatest challenge in my uh, career was upward mobility. And uh, my upward mobility came when I worked in the federal programs and then uh, Mr. Pr Mr. Smith, who was superintendent of schools, a stone segregationist, made me principal of Ardmore Elementary School, having made the last man principal in 1942. All of my successes, I can say, are, have been rewarding. When you impact someone's life, whether it be students, parents, or your former colleagues, and to see them grow, to see them move into positions, to see them become doctor, lawyers, etc. It's just a thrilling, rewarding experience. And it certainly makes you happy that you chose education as your career. Mm -hmm.